Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter, Susan Shand, and Brian Lynn. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, here is Mario Ritter. Two men and a woman have won the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics for their inventions in the field of laser physics. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences says half of the $1 million prize will go to Arthur Ashkin of the United States. The other half will be shared by Gérard Moreau of France and Donna Strickland of Canada. The Swedish Academy said their discoveries made possible tools made of light that improve scientific research, industry, and medicine. These devices are opening unexplored areas of research and a multitude of industrial and medical applications, it said. Moru and Strickland are being recognized for their work on high-intensity lasers. The Swedish Academy praised them for developing a way to increase the power and usefulness of lasers. A laser is a device that produces an intense beam of light. In a report published in 1985, Strickland proposed stretching and then compressing laser light. She and Moru found a way to produce a powerful laser pulse that lasts an almost unimaginably short period of time. Their technique puts more light in the same tiny space, greatly increasing its intensity. Their discoveries led to very precise, powerful lasers that can cut holes in different materials, including living tissue. Such lasers are now used in corrective eye operations. Millions of these operations have been performed on people around the world. Strickland is only the third woman to ever win the Nobel Physics Prize. The first was Marie Curie of France in 1903. Strickland spoke briefly about the lack of women physics winners in a telephone call with the Academy. Obviously, we need to celebrate women physicists because we're out there, and hopefully in time, it'll start to move forward at a faster rate, maybe, she said. Moru said, I am very, very happy to share this distinction with my former student, Donna Strickland, and also to share it with Art Ashkin for whom I have a lot of respect. The American scientist will receive half of the prize money for what the Academy called optical tweezers. Ashkin discovered that the radiation pressure from a beam of light can be used to move extremely small objects and hold them in position. In 1987, he used a laser 
to seize and hold bacteria without harming them. His discovery made possible new ways to study microscopic biology and other objects. At the age of 96, Ashkin is the oldest person to ever receive a Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize in Physics will be officially presented at ceremonies in Stockholm, Sweden on December 10th. The first physics prize was given in 1901 by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. I'm Mario Ritter. in Myanmar to build statues of independence hero General Aung San risks renewed tensions with the country's ethnic minorities. It could also affect the ruling party's chances in planned elections, observers say. Aung San is the father of National League for Democracy leader Aung San Suu Kyi, he is popular in large parts of Myanmar, also called Burma. Aung San's critics are more likely to be found in border areas where many ethnic minorities live. Some there say the statues are a part of what they call continued Burmanization. They instead would like to see statues representing heroes that belong to their own ethnic group. In Kaya State, there have been large protests against a planned Aung San statue. If we're going to have statues, it should be of heroes in our state, said Mi Mi, a civil society leader. He added that the central government should ask local people what statues they want. Ethnic minorities have long been distrustful of a central government dominated by the country's Bamar majority. When Burma gained independence from the British in 1948, representatives of ethnic minority groups signed a deal that would provide them with full autonomy. The agreement was never honored. The distrust grew stronger over many years of military rule. Armed ethnic groups operating in the border areas fought with troops, and strong hatred continues to exist. Many minorities hoped the situation would change when the National League for Democracy won elections in 2015, but distrust has continued to grow. Aung San Suu Kyi promised to work for peace, but has not had much success. Members of ethnic minority groups now consider her as being closely allied with the military. There appears to have been an increase in the number of Aung San statues being built since the NLD came to power. In June 2017, the country's largest Aung San statue was unveiled in Mandalay. Several others have been set up in ethnic minority areas. It is not clear who is paying for the statues, a spokesperson for the NLD could not be reached for comment. In July, thousands of people protested a planned statue in Kaya State. Weeks later, another Aung San statue in Mayat Kiina, the capital of Kachin State, was attacked. 
The editor of the Chinlin Post in Chin State, Salai Ho Lee, told VOA the state government is planning to build at least two Aung San statues there. He added that most locals oppose the statues because they believe the money for them is wasted. They believe the money should be used to help develop one of the country's poorest areas. That money should be used for the town's development, he said. Salai Holi added that water systems, hospitals, and roads are in bad condition and need rebuilding. Another statue is planned in Hakka, the state capital, and he said a decision to do so had not included discussion with the local communities. I'm Susan Shand. One year has passed since Hurricane Maria struck the United States territory of Puerto Rico. But even before the storm hit, education officials had begun closing schools on Puerto Rico to save money. Last year, the territory's government sought legal protection from creditors because it owed billions of dollars in debts that could not be paid. In the weeks and months after Hurricane Maria, the number of students on the island dropped as conditions worsened. Thousands of Puerto Rican families fled to the U.S. mainland. Many students ended up attending schools in Florida or other states along the East Coast. At the time, education officials reported that about half of Puerto Rico's schools had lower than normal student attendance rates. Only about 60% of classroom seats were filled. The government ended up closing nearly 300 schools. Education officials said the move was necessary to meet budget targets. But the closures created problems for Puerto Rican students and their parents when the new school year started a few weeks ago. With many schools closed, some students had to travel outside their neighborhood to attend school. Their parents were often required to find transportation to and from the school. The children also had new teachers and classmates to get used to. Ana Maria Garcia Blanco is the director of Instituto Nueva Escuela, a nonprofit group that works with schools all over Puerto Rico. She says parents have expressed concern that so many changes could harm the overall quality of students' education. Parents are very concerned about overcrowded classrooms and losing uh, experiences that they had before where their children had more personal attention and smaller classrooms uh, and more attention from the teacher. Garcia Blanco said another parental concern she heard is that even more schools would be closed in the future in an effort to cut costs. Those that had good schools are concerned about losing them, she said. Recently, the Youth Development Institute of Puerto Rico reported on how education was influenced by Hurricane Maria. The report was based on information collected from more than 500 Puerto Rican students aged 5 to 17. 
nearly 80% of the students reported attending public school. The study found that, on average, students had missed 78 days during the 2017-2018 school year. In addition, teachers reported observing different or unusual behaviors in 23% of students after the hurricane hit. About 12% of students had problems concentrating, while about 10% had lower levels of academic performance. About 8% showed a lack of interest in studying, while nearly 6% were observed to have other behavior issues. Garcia Blanco says even some of the students who fled to the U.S. mainland after Hurricane Maria experienced problems. A big issue in some areas was a lack of bilingual education for Puerto Rican students who are used to speaking Spanish in class. Although many of our children could handle English as a second language or as a subject matter in the school program, they did not have the language skills to survive an English-only school in the state. In many cases, she says, Puerto Rican children were put in classes with students of lower grade levels because of their English skills alone. For example, a child that had finished a fifth grade here in the school, they would put him or her in the fourth or third grade. So parents were very concerned with the self-esteem and the, you know, and, and the life of that child in schooling. At least 150,000 Puerto Ricans have fled the island since Hurricane Maria, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies reports. The center is part of Hunter College in New York State. The center's director said the large number shows the level of frustration people have with the government's overall response. Garcia Blanco says many Puerto Ricans have become deeply concerned that government decisions related to education were made without their input. They don't feel they have been part of any of the decisions, she said, and they are worried that they won't have anything to say and things will keep happening. I'm Brian Lynn. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. James Knox Polk moved into the White House as the 11th President of the United States in 1845. Few had predicted that Polk would become President. Even he was surprised. Polk had come to his party's presidential nominating convention nearly a year earlier with low expectations. But the top politicians, including former President Martin Van Buren, failed to win a majority of votes. Convention delegates tried again and again to agree on a candidate. Eventually, Polk was nominated. A small number of delegates supported him. Then the delegates voted again. This time, Polk received all 266 votes. He became the first dark horse candidate in U.S. history to be nominated by a major party. In other words, he was someone no one thought would win, but he did. Polk was born in the southeastern state of North Carolina. When he was a child, his family moved west to Tennessee. At the time, Tennessee had few white settlers. Some considered it the wilderness. Polk's family did well there. His father became wealthy, buying land 
and enslaved people. His mother, Jane, who followed strict Christian religious teachings, gave her ten children a good education. James was the oldest. He went to college, then studied law. When he was 25, he married an intelligent and wealthy young woman named Sarah Childress. The two never had children, but they worked together to launch Polk's political career. In time, Polk was elected to the Tennessee House of Representatives, then the National House of Representatives. There, he developed a close relationship with President Andrew Jackson. Since Jackson was called Old Hickory, Polk became known as Young Hickory. When Polk left Congress and returned to Tennessee to become governor, he supported Jackson's banking reforms. But soon the U.S. economy collapsed. Tennessee voters failed to re-elect Polk as governor, not once, but twice. So Polk returned to his plantations and waited for a chance to re-enter national politics. In 1844, Polk traveled to the city of Baltimore to attend the Democratic Party's national convention. He thought he could perhaps win the nomination for vice president. Instead, he became the Democrats' candidate for president. Several months later, he narrowly defeated the opposing party's candidate in the national election. Historian Robert Mary wrote a book about Polk's presidency. Mary says one reason Polk won the election was the issue of Texas. Polk wanted to make Texas a state. He thought the United States could take possession of the area peacefully. The other leading candidates did not. Mary says the other candidates were right. The United States eventually went to war with Mexico, but Polk spoke for the American people. In the 1840s, many Americans liked the idea of expanding the country. They believed in manifest destiny, the idea that God wanted America to expand west all the way to the Pacific Ocean and take control of the continent. As a result, many voters supported Polk and his promise to add Texas to the United States. Polk took another unusual position in the 1844 election. He said if he won the presidency, he would serve only one term, that is, four years. Several previous presidents had served two terms. Polk told voters presidents might abuse their power if they held office too long. One term, he said, would be enough for him. But Robert Mary says there was more to Polk's one-term promise. It was a political bet. Polk thought if he said he would serve as president for only one term, other party leaders might help him win. Then, those politicians could try again to win the presidency in four years, instead of waiting eight. He was probably right. If Polk had not made the campaign promise, Mary says, young Hickory would not have won. During the first days of his administration, James K. Polk 
famously listed the four things he planned to do as president. He wanted to reduce taxes on imports. He wished to establish an independent treasury. He hoped to settle the dispute with Britain over the Oregon border. And he wanted to get California for the United States. Less than four years later, Polk had realized each item on his list. He is remembered for greatly expanding the size of the United States. He successfully negotiated with Britain for U.S. control over territory in the West up to the 49th parallel. The agreement gave the U.S. the current states of Oregon, Idaho, and Washington. Below those states lay California. An American government minister once described California as the richest, the most beautiful, and the healthiest country in the world. The official said, the port of San Francisco was big enough to hold all the navies of the world. He said, someday San Francisco would control the trade of all the Pacific Ocean. There was only one problem from the point of view of the U.S. government. California was part of Mexico. At first, U.S. officials attempted to buy California from Mexico, but Mexican officials refused even to talk about selling California to the United States. Shortly after the U.S. Congress approved statehood for Texas in early 1845, Mexico broke relations with the U.S. altogether. The following year, Mexican troops crossed the Rio Grande and clashed with American soldiers. In answer, President Polk asked Congress to declare war. He did not think the conflict would last long. He believed the U.S. declaration would quickly force Mexico to sell him the territory he wanted. Polk was wrong. Historian Robert Mary says, the war with Mexico lasted longer, was more expensive, and cost more lives than Polk expected. But in the 1848 treaty that ended the war, Polk got the land he had wanted. Mexico recognized the independence of Texas and did not stop it from joining the United States. And it sold the areas that are now all or part of the states of Arizona, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, Wyoming, Colorado, and yes, California. President Polk kept his promise to serve only one term. After four years, he retired from the presidency, traveled for a few weeks, and then returned to Tennessee to settle in a new home. But Polk did not have much time there. He had been sick often throughout his life, but he became seriously ill during his travels. Only three months after he left the White House, Polk died. He left behind a much larger country, but a divided one. The issue was again slavery. Southerners argued that they had the right to take enslaved people into California and other former Mexican lands. Northerners opposed any further spread of slavery. The question was this, did Congress have the power to control or even ban slavery in the new territories? And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.